This video is going to look at the difference between North and South Korea and the challenges of reunification. After World War II, Korea regained its autonomy from Imperial Japan. On August 10, 1945, the 38th parallel was established as the dividing line between the Soviet-administered North and American-administered South. The Korean War made this supposedly temporary division seemingly permanent. We already know that after 70 years of separation, the differences between the authoritarian North and democratic South couldn't be more profound. There's constant tension from nuclear tests, military skirmishes, threats of turning one side or the other into powder, and even though officials from both countries met again in December 2015 to discuss improved relations, the failed unification talks in 1972 and 2000, coupled with the intense secrecy of Kim Jong-un's regime, leave plenty of room for well-founded skepticism. But let's go deeper with this topic. Anyone could tell you that finding political will for unification will be difficult, but assuming the political will was there, what would the challenges to reunification actually be? The first factor is the means by which the unification comes about. Since 1969, the South Korean government has maintained a Ministry of Unification, which plans for the scenario of a gradual reuniting of the two countries. Indeed, most reunification plans are premised in gradual integration integration over time. However, many experts believe that a total collapse of the North Korean regime is the only way reunification could ever truly happen. But this is a nightmare scenario for world governments. A sudden collapse of the North Korean regime would leave nuclear arms unsecured. North Korea has nuclear weapons estimated between 10 and 15 kilotons in strength. Also, North Korea experiences nearly constant famine. Collapse would lead to the evacuation of potentially millions of refugees refugees to the south and to China. In fact, in leaked documents, the Chinese already have emergency planning for this scenario, which includes gathering North Korean refugees in camps, turning back undesirables at the border, and protecting North Korean military and political leaders from what they call foreign influence. But even if stage one after a collapse is handled orderly, there are huge obstacles to a smooth unification. First, after seven decades of separation, the language and culture of the two Koreas has shifted dramatically. Not just democracy versus authoritarianism, the actual language. For example, though both dialects of Korean maintain similar grammar, experts estimate that up to one third of words used on a daily basis have diverged, and it currently takes takes North Korean defectors up to two years to feel comfortable conversing in the South. Second, the Korean court system has the potential to be overwhelmed, as formerly held residential and business property is reclaimed from the pre-separation times. Healthcare infrastructure would also be a severe challenge. The life expectancy in South Korea is currently 10 years more than in the North, and infant mortality is far lower. Bringing the North's hospitals into the 21st century and retraining their doctors would be pricey. Another big difference between North and South Korea is the general infrastructure. The North has between 12,000 and 20,000 miles of unpaved, crumbling roads with few privately owned vehicles. The train system there is ancient compared to the South's high-speed network. Even the majority of their planes are outdated Soviet aircrafts flying out of dilapidated airports. But by far, the largest price tag would come from balancing economic disparities. South Korean President Park describes the economic activity associated with unification as a bonanza. She says, just as the German people secured freedom, prosperity, and peace by tearing down the Berlin Wall, we too must tear down barriers in our march towards a new future on the Korean Peninsula. But according to the IMF and World Bank, South Korea is the world's 13th largest economy with per capita income of well over 34,000 US dollars. Meanwhile, the average North Korean might take in about 2,000 US dollars per year. And many of those people are employed in the country's massive 1.2 million man army. The South's economy is 43 times larger than the North, and bridging that gap would not be easy. Overall cost estimates for all this, for total reunification, vary widely, from 50 billion to more than 3 trillion. While the difference between North and South Korea continues to grow, relations between the US and another one of our Cold War adversaries has thawed. Click here to see a comprehensive history of that relationship, and subscribe to Political Junkie News for a deeper understanding of the news and of history. Later guys.